Can you can the people in the back here get Sam Moskowitz to translate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it gives uh, me a great deal of pleasure um, to be able to speak to you today in the role of Toastmaster. Um, when the committee asked me if I would be Toastmaster, at first I was extremely delighted because I am nothing if not a public ham. However, I then realized there were one or two factors that uh, were not in my favor, and this gave me cause for thought. The first one is that I realized this would be an international meeting. Now, international humor varies. I don't think there is anything such as international humor. I, um, as those of you who know me, am an American who, li who lives more or less permanently in England. I have learned to tell English jokes. <laughs> Englishmen will laugh at my jokes. Once a year, I go uh, <laughs> to Harrison was at the 
the London world, Carl. And, you could and I can't even remember him. <laughs> but you have no idea of what sort of a condition I was in. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, at Harrogate, uh, at the uh, a British convention four years ago, um, I met Brian once again, um, and we since then have been very close friends. Brian Aldis, then, our guest of honor. He is a writer par excellence under his own name and under the name of many pseudonyms. He is a poet. He is a Hugo winner. He is an ex-president of the BSFA. He is a co-founder and co-editor of Science Fiction Horizons. But most important of all, he is our guest of honor and our main speaker today.
the hero started with loss of identity and loss of memory. Still went on the big <laughs> Now, things have changed since then. But um, the, the interesting thing about the paranoid formula, it's a very good formula. It's the one that is used by George Orwell in 1984. All he did was to reverse it. The hero is still a victim of a worldwide conspiracy, but he only loses his identity at the end. <laughs> That's quite a good argument for proving conclusively that 1984 was science fiction. He got it all from Van Vogt. <laughs> now, such formulas are still used. Uh, William Burroughs uh, has a go at this conspiracy thing. But I think on a whole, the writers of 1965 are interested with other problems. I don't know if I dare say healthier problems, but certainly with other problems. Uh, we have now the uh, semi-satirical, satirical novel. We have the sort of tongue-in-cheek novel that Kurt Vonnegut writes so very excellently. We have the sort of novel that J.G. Ballard uh, felicitously used the phrase for the novel of inner space. Now, I think it's possible to see which way this trend is going, because whether you use the term inner or outer space, the space itself may be objective enough, but inner and outer are points that bear reference to mankind at the centre. <coughs> and I think that from now on, dare I say this, mankind is going to be more central, and the novels perhaps will show a greater awareness of the individual. The characters won't be, don't frown like that. The individuals uh, will be more important and you will see them reacting on their environment as well as the environment reacting on them. This isn't particularly revolutionary because uh, John Wyndham, for instance, and John Christopher have both been doing it for a number of years under various pseudonyms. Uh, I just think that this may possibly be uh, an up-and-coming trend, whereas in the Van Votian tale, one, do I pronounce that right, or is it Van Vogt? No, I don't really know. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to hang a Van Vogt on it sometime. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hot flush of <laughs> That's an achievement. Anyhow, uh, this, uh, this man, who shall be blameless, uh, used to give us uh, Impossible heroes, extraordinary men, lands, mutants, and all the rest of it, all beings by their very nature beyond the bounds of ordinary humanity and indeed ordinary characterization. Uh, we have now entered the age, as Tom Borden touched on when he mentioned the uh, successful flight, the age of the common spaceman. <laughs> You'll probably, if I might give an instant, instance of this, and I hesitate glancing at my notes, I see I have to do a parody of an American accent. But you will remember when McDivitt and White did their the earth shaking, could it? When they did that ether shaking orbiting and um, got out and had a walk around, they were up in the capsule and they had the conversation back to base with their wives and uh, they said this is where it comes, watch for it. Hello there, honey. Oh, I have it phonetically. <laughs> this is me. Can you hear me? Sure, I can hear you, honey. Can you hear me? You're coming through loud and clear. How are you, honey? Oh, I'm just fine. How are you, honey? Well, I'm fine, too. Are the kids being good? <laughs> you see, it's the age of the common spaceman. <laughs> now, ten years ago, I did a bit of research. I read up on my old galaxies. The 1955 ones have arrived here now. <laughs> and I've got a bit here. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> I have a bit here from a story by James Gunn in 1955 Galaxy. Very nice story. Cave of Night. I'm sure Fred Reed wrote it. <laughs> and this is an extract from the first epic broadcast of his spaceman when he was in orbit. I'll spare you the American accent. 
I've been staring out of the portholes. I, I never tire of that. Through the one on the right, I see what looks like a black velvet curtain with a strong light behind it. There are pinpoint holes in the curtain, and the light shines through, not winking the way stars do, but steady. There's no air up here, that's the reason. <laughs> the mind can understand and still misinterpret. Now, you may laugh, you, but ten years ago, that was oratory for you. There's no mention, you notice, of, of a kid being <laughs> We never wrote it like that. But the contemporary mode is very much against now what James Gunn was doing very well ten years ago. <coughs> now, when all the fans, I include myself in that, unfortunately, bemoan the lost se sense of wonder, I think they're probably bemoaning the passing of those two things, the sort of Van Vottian paranoid tale and the good old steamy oratory with the stars looking like holes in a black curtain. The approach now is more oblique. The voice of the author is more individual and the whole mood, I think, is more hip and more cool. The whole feel, I'm sure everyone agrees to this, is less cohesive than it was ten years ago. It's still sticky, but it's not so cohesive. <laughs> and all of this, I'm sure, leads to much better conditions for the writing of good science fiction. I'd better sum this up in case none of you are clear what the devil I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm visualizing science fiction as um, something sparkling and alive and changing with changing conditions and reflecting those conditions. It's like, um, it's like the, the work of Henry James, but funny. <laughs> uh, well, well, as I say, uh, uh, this was a speech I could have made, you know, the great science fiction speech for all ages. But... Um, I was uh, listening to John Brennan yesterday, and he did it, you see. <laughs> so, uh, I had to move on to the next alternative. And I suddenly realized that when I stood up here, no one could interrupt me apart from Harry Harrison. <laughs> uh, I could just stand here and talk about myself. And I could go on and on and on until Ella Parker stopped me. <laughs> You know, you make a good, captive audience, you sit there, half drunk, half fed. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the sort of speech that I liked. And, uh, <clears throat> well, I was rehearsing it naked in front of a full-length mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, then I thought, yes, yes, uh, I was in the aisles, rolling with laughter. <laughs> and then suddenly I realized that everyone would look at their programs. They'd hear what old Tom had to say. they know I couldn't cap it. And they'd all think, well, at least we've got Terry Carr and Arthur C. Clarke to come next. <laughs> so all I'm going to do is to say, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. You're all very kind and charming. Thank you very, very much indeed.
and is now associate editor of Ace Books. It's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Terry Carr. Thank <laughs> you. 
very, very committee men rushing around, always looking at their watches as though they're rushing off from me with the Red Queen. Bill Parker. <laughs>
celebrities that needs no introduction, and for once I'm going to fool everybody, and I'm hardly going to introduce him. I'm just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, here is Arthur C. Clarke. Simple 
explanation of this, and it was a perfectly identifiable object, so I won't. But it, it was very, um, it showed how apparently reputable observers could be fooled. Well, then we started on the script, and one by one we threw away the short stories, until eventually of the five, we had only one left, called The Sentinel, which was originally published by someone whose name escapes me. Oh, since you'll see, Carnell, I think, or <laughs> Carnell, uh, in a magazine called New Worlds, uh, it had a cover, I believe. Well, The Sentinel was the only one of these stories that we used. And eventually, after kind of sort of monopoly game, I bought back my five remaining short stories from Stanley at a thousand dollars each. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, and, ended, and wrote a completely new novel. And the, um, originally the, the, the story, the film was to be called Journey Beyond the Stars, and it was advertised as such. But there have been so many journeys and voyages and trips and excursions and that uh, this is indistinguishable from lots of other titles. And now it's called uh, 2001, uh, the subtitle The Space Odyssey. And that is a very accurate title because the space policy is really what we were aiming at. Now, the screenplay is by Stanley Kubrick and R.C. Clarke, based on the novel by R.C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> 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 this, this, is, uh, this is my suggestion uh, because, in fact, Stanley, who is quite a genius and a very nice guy and an unusual combination, and I think we're only one of the ones, did uh, <laughs> uh, contribute many of the basic ideas to the story and um, is fully entitled to co-authorship. There are a lot of problems in making a space movie. One of the great difficulties, of course, is showing convincing extraterrestrials. It is not true that we have solved this problem by having the roles of all the extraterrestrials played by Peter Sellers. <laughs> <laughs> Though uh, Peter was quite interested. <laughs> uh, once we decided to go ahead on this project, I retired from Hotel Chelsea on 23rd Street, which is the famous literary hotel of New York, which has, at various times, extended hospitality to Oh Henry. Mark Twain, Thomas Wolfe, and in later days, uh, Brandon Van and Dylan Thomas lived there, and there, there are plaques recording this event on the front of the hotel. They left a blank for another plaque. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's full of artists and writers. Uh, Arthur Miller lives there. Um, William Burroughs was staying there at the time. and. Uh, He's quite an interesting, quiet little man. He's like a church warden or a a boy scout troop. Very <laughs> shy <laughs> and retiring. I didn't manage to get into a Hydra club dinner, and Judy Merrill uh, signed him up to do something for an next anthology. I hope this isn't a secret. Anyway, it's <laughs> war. <laughs> anyway, the, um, the first draft of this epic was finished on Christmas Eve. And I delivered it to Sandy then, and he went away with it. It was horrible, but at least it was good enough to persuade MGM to put up $5 million. And the, <laughs> it's been filmed in Cinerama, so you people at the local bioscope will have to wait for a year or so before it comes around in old fashioned Cinemascope. But uh, the release date is. Uh, Christmas next. Uh, the sets, which are quite fantastic, have been built out at Boreham Wood, where the, all the interior has been done on about six or seven stages. There's about a month shooting in Africa. I don't know quite where that's going to be, but sometime in the, in the spring. Well, I, I hope you'll enjoy the film and the book when it comes out. Uh, the book I hope will be out in the spring. I just haven't finished it yet, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of publishers and agents have chewed their fingernails. But we hope that this will be the destination of the 1970s. Uh, this, we think it's the 
first serious large-scale attempt to put space travel in the contemporary setting. And I hope you all uh, like candle forests. Uh, you'll be reading a lot about this in future, and you'll hardly be able to escape it, so I won't say anything more about it now. In any case, I think I've used up my 15 minutes. But uh, a lot of other things happened in America, even though I was not, uh, even though I was spending most of the time writing this James Electric typewriter. I did bring back some souvenirs, if I can find them, <coughs> would interest you. Uh, I escaped once to Washington to the launching of the early bird satellite, which I saw to CompSat headquarters with Vice President Humphrey and a lot of uh, CompSat brass. And I picked up two, I was given two interesting souvenirs there, which I think will amuse you. I hold them holding in my hand. There's just there's less than 200 years between these two artifacts, which are from two of the most famous vehicles in the history of the human race. Less than 200 years between them. This is a nail from the bounty. This is part of the heat shield, the Apollo spacecraft. And I say this rather less than 200 years, and I think it's rather hard to imagine any two artifacts that bridge a comparable technological gulf. It's a pretty good indication of the age we're living in. Thank you. program will have noted that there is to be a mystery speaker. Equally percipient members of the convention will have had no difficulty at all in solving this mystery. Our next speaker is, again, a man who needs no introduction other than his name, Mr. Robert Block. years. I'm so, so thrilled to be here today in uh, London. You've <laughs> got to excuse me, I'm, uh, I must admit I'm a little bit drunk. George O. Smith breathes on me. <laughs> but it's, it's a wonderful experience. Like Arthur, who I'm glad to see here, I met him yesterday in the lobby where he was giving autographs with a tattooing needle. <laughs> <laughs> like Arthur, I'm over here on a film project of my own, which will be called uh, Mary Poppins Meets the Wolfman. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see so many other familiar faces. I'm glad, for example, that uh, Frederick Cole is here because he brought Kara. <laughs> I'm happy to see Karen Anderson and what's his name. <laughs> I'm very thrilled that uh, John Campbell, whose editorials I've been ghostwriting for so many years. <laughs> the one dream of my life, however, has not been realized. Our guest of honor, Brian Aldous, is here. But I've been hoping <laughs> that he would be present with the Archbishop of Canterbury on the same platform. Because then, of course, we have all this in heaven, too. <laughs> Actually, the uh, trip was a little bit unexpected. I had intended, or I hoped, or wished that uh, Oxford might uh, send me over here on a scholarship. But uh, actually, I came on a cattle ship. <laughs> rather a, a rough trip, as I realized, as soon as the captain heaved the anchor. I, uh, <laughs> there were several other disasters, you know. I, I lost all my luggage. The cork fell out. <laughs> but uh, I finally made it. And there have been very few disappointments. I will say, of course, that there are some letdowns. We did enjoy visiting Westminster Abbey, the poor man's forest lawn. <laughs> we went up to the Tower of London. I was disappointed there. I spoke to one of the beef eaters and he turned out to be a vegetarian. <laughs> and uh, 
Then yesterday in the lobby, I was approached by a gentleman, and he said, would you give a contribution to the Willis Fund? I said, that was three years ago. He said, there's a new one. I was suspicious. I said, oh, how can I be sure this money will get to Willis? He says, you can bet on it, I'm Willis. <laughs>
that there were certain individuals who, through the years, had contributed a great deal to science fiction, and there was no particular way to reward them. So starting the year after the death of E. Everett Evans, the Big Heart Award was created, not by myself. I have merely been the implementation of it, actually, of Walter J. Dorothy, of one of the charter members of the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society 31 years ago is the instigator of this idea. I merely stand in for him each year. It is possible for the winner to be a professional as well as a fan, if, as in the case of Robert Block, who was the first winner. He has contributed notably in the fan field. Previous winners have included Rick Snary, B. Joe Trimble, James Teresi, who very faithfully for 25 years has provided the entire world with the news of science fiction fandom, Sam Moskowitz. This year I'm very pleased to announce that the award will go to this side of the Atlantic Ocean. So far no fandom has arisen in France or Italy or Holland or Spain. But during the past 10 years, one has steadily grown. There is a very definite organization now in Germany. As a matter of fact, they're looking forward, I understand, a few years to inviting the world there <coughs> to a convention. And one man above all can be said to be the father of German science fiction. There was a perilous time some years ago when the fate of science fiction itself was at stake in Germany. This man went to Bonn to do battle with the government there on behalf of science fiction. His heart is so large that it encompasses, to my certain knowledge, not only Western Germany, but Eastern Germany. And I would like at this point to call forward Austria's own Walter Ernsting to receive the E. Everett Evans Memorial Award for 1965. Asimov. 
And it was his <laughs> unhappy task to hand out an award that he himself had never, ever won. And uh, as he let everyone know, he was a little displeased at this, this long and mysterious thing. So he stood up here and called out one Hugo winner after another. And they came up and got their trophy. And he, he wrestled with them a little as they... <laughs> but they all managed to get the, the, uh, the trinket away from them. <laughs> he got gloomier and gloomier, and uh, the anguish grew, and our hearts were breaking for him. And then he, he opened up the last the envelope with the last mysterious name, and it was the name of Isaac Asimov, which uh, I think I've said even more. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined the whole bit, he cried. <laughs> well, uh, I won't be delivering any kind of anguish comment like that. I have a right to I had it a long time, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good year ago. It's, it's a little small than that one. <laughs> but uh, I've had it nine years, and I, I, I wouldn't weep too hard if I got another, but I don't feel the same way that Isaac did when he had it. Uh, I got mine in 1946. Well, 1956. <laughs> Uh, as the most promising new author of 1956. <laughs> this, is, this is a, a category that is not on the list of awards every year. In fact, there have only been three such awards in the whole checkered history of the Hugo Award. Uh, Philip Jose Farmer was the first most promising author in 1953. And uh, my turn came three years later, and as I stood there clutching my Hugo, Mrs. Philip Jose Farmer came up to me and pointed out that uh, I was now the next most promising author. <laughs> and she said, smiling broadly, Phil hasn't written a word since he got it. <laughs> <laughs> the outstanding promising author, and then we gave the award away again. Uh, the incumbent most promising author is somewhere behind me, uh, Brian Aldis. <laughs> I don't remember when he, I don't remember when he was his, uh, but he, there hasn't been another one since. So Brian is still the, the reigning most promising author of science. <laughs> <laughs> now this promissory note, <laughs> now, it, it happens, it's a, a strange coincidence, that two of the men who figured most prominently in the ceremony the night that I got my Hugo are present here on the dais. Uh, one of the who, who handed me the thing, he, he, he put it in my hands and smiled and said something encouraging. <laughs> uh, the other, who perhaps is not even aware that he was deeply involved in my emotions of the evening, is obviously Clark. <laughs> Arthur was the guest of honor that night, and as you've seen here, the guest of honor always speaks before the presentation of the Hugo, which is saved for the, the finale of the banquet. And the people who are nominated for the Hugo sit in a uh, state of disturbance, <laughs> uh, waiting for the preliminary events to end. Arthur that night was uh, speaking about the future. He's telling us all about it. <laughs> and he told us first about the 1960s, which worked out very well, as, as he knew they would. <laughs> and then he told us about the 1970s, and I rocked back and forth on my chair. I am a fidgeter anyway, and I have special reasons for fidgeting. And he got us to the 1980s and the 1990s, and I poured a glass of water and looked at my watch and rocked back and forth, and I rocked so far back, I think I put the chair on Chris Moskowitz's toe. <laughs> and she looked at me sharply and said, will you stop fidgeting? And I couldn't turn around to her and say, well, perhaps I'm going to win a Hugo tonight, and I'm uneasy, because perhaps I wouldn't win a Hugo, and then I'd feel even sillier. <laughs> so I went on listening to Arthur. I think he got up to the year 2753. <laughs> Sometime well after midnight, because we hold these things in the evening, generally. And 
And he had given us a fairly good rundown by the time we got around to the usual awards. So I'm grateful to you, Arthur. It was a lesson in patience. <laughs> uh, having endured that little episode myself, I won't inflict undue torment upon the happy people here who will be winning jingos today. I'll get get down to the matter right now. In one of my pockets, I have the list of the winners, and I'll produce it and proceed to call them all. And I will end the suspense. <laughs> Now, despite the effortless ease with which I lifted that with one hand, it's a great bulky, heavy thing, and so to, to spare the airfares of the transatlantic Hugo winners who will have to haul the things back with them, we have but the one Hugo here which we will display and let you fumble as you come up, and then we'll take it away from you. <laughs> Eventually. You will not have to pay air surplus charges for it. So, I wondered, I wondered to Ella, I said it to her, I don't think it made her happy. I said to her, what if I open up this piece of paper and don't approve of some of the names on it? <laughs> what can be done after I've made the public announcements? And at that point, I almost lost my position as Hugo presenter. <laughs> so I just warned to Ella that I will actually read off the names on this list, and you can come out and have your quick touch. <laughs> we have a great many categories here. And it says 23rd World Science Fiction Convention, London, 1965. <laughs> Hugo winners, <laughs> 1965. Best uh, Fanzine, Young Girl, edited by Robert and Monita Krulson of Indiana. Your Terry card to reach out and touch it for you. Careful, Best short story Soldier Ask Not by Gordon Dixon.
Dr. Strange right here to accept the war. But we do have Peter George who wrote the novel on which the movie was made. Peter George is not a transatlantic person and does not have to worry about airfare, so we will let him keep this one. Thank you very much. I would not like to conclude this um, auspicious occasion without expressing all of our thanks. Uh, to the staff of the hotel and to everybody who uh, passed out the food to us in uh, such an efficient way. But also I would like, I think, to express all of your thanks to the committee who organized this banquet. Your thanks to all of the speakers who spoke, although I must say I didn't see one of them who appeared not to enjoy speaking, but that's as it should be. And finally, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I think they would like to thank you all for attending this banquet. Thank you.